Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. I'm Jenna Kirsten, your moderator for today's webinar. If you've joined us before, we've had a couple of sessions on privacy versus security and internal accountability, and today we're going to be talking about breach notifications. So just a few things before we dive in. All attendees will be muted throughout the session, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature located in the GoToWebinar toolbar. I will monitor those throughout the hour, and we'll have some time reserved at the end to answer those. This session is also being recorded. All attendees will receive a link to the recording, as well as a copy of these slides in your inbox. Just a little bit of background about who we are. Kirkpatrick Price is a licensed CPA firm providing assurance services to clients worldwide. Our firm has over 13 years of experience in information assurance by performing assessments, audits, and tests that strengthen information security and compliance controls. We offer information security services such as audits, pen tests, plus readiness and guidance on frameworks like SOC 1 and SOC 2, PCI, HIPAA, and GDPR. We also encourage you to connect with us by subscribing to our blog, visiting our library of recorded webinars so you can catch up at any time, and following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Now I'd like to welcome our speaker for today, Mark Heinley. He is the Director of Regulatory Compliance here at Kirkpatrick Price, and he's been leading this series. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you to all of you for uh, joining us on today's presentation about breach notification. Um, before I begin, I want to make uh, the legal disclaimer for us, uh, just to confirm that this presentation is just for educational and informational purposes and does not constitute legal advice. So we're not going to establish any attorney-client relationship uh, through this presentation. And if you do need legal advice, we ask and recommend that you consult with your own attorney. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about uh, breach notification. So um, there, are, there are two kinds of organizations. Uh, our, our company likes to say there are two kinds of organizations. There are those that know they've been breached and those that don't know yet. And, um, and so, uh, but sometimes when we're talking to, to prospective clients or, or uh, participating in industry events, we kind of get the, nope, we haven't seen any cake approach to, to data breaches. Um, there's evidence all over the place that something has gone bad, whether it's either for that organization in particular or um, in, in a certain industry that indicates that uh, security has been compromised, and yet organizations are reluctant to, to address it, uh, even with the, uh, the evidence being obvious. And so um, we don't recommend that you take the nope, we haven't seen any cake approach to data breaches because we think that it's, uh, it's futile. And so today's, today's goal is to really uh, move us from a perspective of it's not going to happen to us, it can't happen to us, and it hasn't happened to us, to uh, we're going to be prepared and we're going to be um, confident and we're going to manage the situation rather than let the situation manage us. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about our agenda for today. Uh, first, we're just going to talk about this idea that bad things happen. Um, and second, we're going to talk about some of the regulatory requirements around breach notification that create exposure for us and our partners. And then finally, we're going to talk about why uh, breach reporting is, is good business. And, I, and that may seem like a strange, strange thing to say, um, but, but I believe that it is. And if we have some time at the end, uh, we'll, we'll allow a few minutes for questions. So let's, let's first talk about um, the reality of, of breach notification and the idea that bad things are going to happen. Rather, and it's a question of, of when rather than if. So uh, first, just to, to quantify this concept, Semantic reports that 24,000 malicious mobile apps are blocked every day. Um, that's part of the security uh, threat landscape. That, that we're experiencing right now. The average cost of a malware attack is $2.4 million, and that cost is growing. And uh, the Irish um, Data Protection Authority and the UK Data Protection Authority have both reported a 100% increase in reported um, uh, data breaches since 
GDPR became enforceable in May um, 2018. So um, that, that's that's a perspective on on increase. Uh, just to give you some numbers, the EU Commission reported 41,000 breach notifications between May 25th of 2018 and January 28th of 2019. But uh, that was for 28, 21 of the 28 EU members. Um, DLA Piper said that if you add the seven other members in from the EU, that you're up to about 60,000 breaches for the same same reporting period. So, so one of the things that we know is, you know, we typically know about breaches because they're self-reported. There, there are some sometimes when, when breaches are discovered, but but if if we're expecting um, organizations to tell us when they've been breached, we know there's an incentive to not be uh, fully transparent. And so uh, I think that's borne out by the fact that um, that some of the data protection authorities are seeing an increase in reported breaches since GDPR came out. I think it's unlikely that security threats have increased 100% from May 25th of 2018 until uh, the end of the reporting period, uh, even though it's possible that, that those threats have increased. I think what's more likely is that the regulatory pressure uh, that the GDPR is generating is is making uh, organizations report more breaches than they have in the past, rather than actually experience more breaches. So, I, I think what we're what we're seeing from GDPR is uh, confirming the notion that that breach, uh, unfortunately, data breaches are an incredibly common experience. Um, so, so the likelihood that that you're going to experience one is, uh, according to, to some uh, estimates in 2018, is that one third of organizations are going to experience uh, a security incident. But I, I think even that's low, um, again, because data breaches are self-reported. So, so if, if the estimate is one third, then we're, we're lo looking more like 40 or 50 percent at least of organizations are, are likely to experience a security incident. That would require uh, that would constitute a data breach and require breach notification. So, you know, the, the goal really at this at the beginning of this presentation is just to um, confirm to you and and if if there were any skeptics out there about the reality of a breach, um, just really confirm to you about the likelihood of a breach um, and the nature of of the breach notification world around us. Um, there's more and more attention being drawn to those to those events from uh, both a public perspective and a regulatory perspective. So it's likely going to be ha happen to you. Um, you know, there's pretty much a one in two chance it's gonna happen to you. There are, there are ongoing threats every day and the costs of, of dealing with such events at, at an average are significant. Well, what, what happens even if you buy into the fact that um, bad things are going to happen? It doesn't make breach notification easy because we have a a bunch of different requirements when it comes to to breaches. So you've got continental, national, and regional laws that create a patchwork of breach notification requirements. So you have you have GDPR, for example, that creates breach notification for for pretty much organizations around the world. And then even within nations, for example, within the U.S., you have uh, breach notification laws. We're going to talk about them a little bit. Um, within each state. And then you have breach notification laws that are either a national or state level that are different from each other, that get, could differ in terms of the time frame to report a breach or the content that's required or the nature of an event that even constitutes a breach. So, so not only do we have a high level of confidence that bad things are gonna happen, but we've got a number of regulatory requirements that conflict with each other that create exposure for ourselves and our business partners, because the way that breach notification typically works is that there is a, a primary organization that's responsible for, for notifying uh, governments and uh, individuals about a data breach. But then there are uh, a number of service providers who are responsible for notifying their, their clients about data breaches. So you have this tremendous exposure um, and, and uh, competing and overlaying uh, requirements across each other. I want to try to reduce some of that uh, confusion and and patchwork and make it a little bit more manageable in this presentation. We're not going to cover all uh, breach notification laws and their requirements, but we're going to do 
a couple of things. First, we're going to talk about some common elements between breach notification requirements to help make things a little bit easier so that you can start creating a, an attempt at a consistent approach to breach notification. Then we're going to get into some specifics about some of the more common uh, or high profile laws that, that uh, and we're going to compare the specifics for those laws. So first, let's talk about the common elements between um, breach notification requirements. For the most part, the, there, are, there are five different elements in, in terms of uh, breach notification requirements. There, first, there's the difference between a security incident and something that actually requires, that is defined as a breach and requires reporting. Um, often there's some sort of risk analysis or, or safe harbor um, or uh, a definition, um, something that, that prevents organizations from having to report on every single type of uh, threat or potential exposure. So that's the first thing, is not all security incidents are reportable breaches, um, uh, and that's defined in law. Second, there's almost always reporting timeframes. There's, there's really only two approaches to timeframes. One is some sort of principle, you know, that breaches are supposed to be reported or required to be reported as soon as possible. And then the other approach is to give an actual time period with time periods ranging from 72 hours under GDPR to 30 to 45 to 60 to even 90 days in some cases. So um, the as soon as possible uh, puts the pressure on an organization, leaves it without knowing what exactly that means. Um, but 72 hours is an incredibly tight turnaround time. Identify, um, have a fair sense of what's going on, and then report a breach. So there's 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 benefits and downsides to both the, the principled approach and then sort of the, the strict time period approach. The third common element is uh, the idea of just a reporting recipient, and it's usually one of, of two things or both, um, that the breaches are either required to be reported to, to one or more government authorities and then the impacted individuals. And in some cases, the, the reporting method to individuals uh, depends on the number of inv individuals involved in the breach. Uh, if it passes a certain, certain threshold, um, some, some laws allow or permit um, sort of a mass notification through media or a press release or something like that. Uh, the fourth element is required content, and there's quite a bit of overlap in this, in this concept um, about the kinds of, of uh, information that should be included in breach notification. And then uh, there are penalties, obviously, for, for violating um, breach notification requirements or, or some other way in which there are negative consequences if reporting isn't done. So let's look at a couple of the um, a couple of breach notification requirements and some different laws, just to put some specifics on this. We're not going to we're not going to go into detail about um, all all breaches uh, breach notification requirements, but here are four different laws that um, would cover a decent number of of organizations between uh, Canada, uh, all of Europe, and then any organization that has EU data subjects, uh, inform personal information HIPAA, and with as a, a national law in the U.S. and then the CCPA which is the recently passed California uh, data protection law. So you can see the five elements that we talked about uh, as common elements, and you can see the specifics here. All of these four laws have um, a threshold for the incident to be uh, reportable as a breach. Uh, in PIPIDA, it's a, a breach that poses a, sig a real risk of sig significant harm. Under GDPR, it's a breach uh, an incident that's likely to cause risk to individuals, so it's a risk approach. HIPAA uh, actually deals with any, it, it has a, a risk analysis process that has a couple of different components. And so we're looking for anything that, uh, anything that has a low probability of, of unsecured PHI uh, doesn't have to be reported. So um, encrypted PHI, unless the encryption key was also accessed, uh, any, any incident with encrypted PHI wouldn't have to be reported. And then CCPA uh, is similar to HIPAA. Uh, unencrypted incidents with unencrypted data or, or data where there's in, uh, encryption, but the credentials are also accessed would be required to be reported. So you've got a threshold. So your first, your first clue is that just because you've had an incident doesn't mean you have to trigger your breach notification process. 
you've got a wide variety of the time frames demonstrated here. Um, uh, two, half of the laws use you know, hard time frames and half of the laws just say as soon as, soon as possible with GDPR being the most strict um, breach notification require that I'm, uh, notification requirement that I'm aware of. And then HIPAA being as far out as, as 60 days. Um, the reporting recipients are, are always um, both governmental and individual in these cases. And, and sometimes uh, the media in the case of HIPAA for breaches that impact more than, than more, more than 500 individuals. When it comes to the required content, you can see that there's uh, pretty much uh, identical uh, elements uh, to these, these breach notification requirements, which would allow you to create a template for the way that you um, notify individuals and, and governments. And, and the positive side for uh, the required content element is that there's no there's no downside, there's no um, regulatory downside for sharing more than is required. There may be some other considerations beyond just the regulatory impact for uh, what to disclose and what to um, keep confidential. But there's no regulatory penalty for sharing more. So you could take uh, the regulatory scheme that requires the most information and, and use that as a standard for all of your um, breach reporting. Um, and then you would likely be compliant with anything as long as you're sharing um, the broadest amount of information. Typically, the information includes a description of the breach, the type of data that's, that's been disclosed, um, the quantity of data that's been disclosed, what organizations are doing to mitigate the impacts of the breach, and then, um, uh, you know, kind of contact information and what, what those who have been impacted by the breach can do to um, prevent harm to themselves. The fines uh, and penalties vary. Uh, three of the four laws have uh, fines for noncompliance. The California um, Consumer Privacy Act doesn't actually have fines for um, within it for, for failing to report a breach, but California has its own um, breach notification law that um, requires that allows for private right of action um, and involves specifically allows for fines for unreported breaches involving medical data. So, so there's a couple of different ways in which organizations that deal in California could be negatively impacted by failing to comply with the breach notification requirements. So I went through the specifics, but what we really wanted to do is just show you how these common elements within breach notification requirements actually look in the laws that are most likely to impact uh, the organizations that typically attend our webinars. So this gives you a sense of, of while there is a patchwork of requirements, that there actually is some commonality that, that can hopefully reduce the stress and regulatory exposure from trying to navigate a, a multitude of breach notification laws and, and data protection laws. All right, so now that we've talked about some, some international um, and uh, national laws, I want to talk about the U.S. specifically because the U.S. has an even greater patchwork of breach notification laws because there are literally 50 different breach notification laws. And I jokingly thought I could talk about all of them right now and we would certainly fill our time frame. But, but instead, what I'm going to do um, is, is go a different direction, just kind of give you a sense of trends and um, sort of common elements between the, the laws themselves. Um, things to be aware of. First, um, more and more states are going to strict notification timelines away and away from sort of the without unreasonable delay or as soon as possible. So moving towards something like a 30, 45, or 60 day timeline. Um, for example, Colorado enacted a law in 2018 that establishes a 30 day deadline for reporting and Arizona did the same thing. Their, their um, new reporting standard is, is a 45 day notification for the attorney general's office. So I think that, that maybe the direction that we go is as long as in the U.S. we're dealing with state um, breach notification requirements that we're going to see a trend towards more specific timeline requirements. There's also a trend to uh, expand the type of information that is subject to these breach notification laws. So things like residence names, um, biometric data, some military information, and other data elements are being included in existing laws and just expanding the scope. Um, and I think we'll see that with things like IP addresses um, uh, and maybe some other items that, that um, are 
um, ported over from, from GDPR. And then the third item um, is sector-specific breach notification requirements. So for example, um, New York has had now for, for a brief period of time a financial, secure, a financial services cybersecurity law that in includes breach notification. And we've got a couple of other states that have added uh, sector industry specific breach notification requirements. Um, Vermont has established uh, breach notification requirements for data brokers. South Carolina has established breach notification requirements for insurers. And then Virginia has uh, established breach notification requirements for tax preparers. So we're seeing a variety of, those are three different industries. Um, uh, well, there's, there's some similarities in terms of uh, financial information, for example, for insurers and tax preparers, they really aren't the same thing. So I expect to see, uh, again, while we're still dealing with a patchwork of state-specific, um, where states have the authority to, to legislate breach notification, I, I expect to see other industries, particularly those that have demonstrated a, a, a poor capacity to be transparent when it comes to breach notification, uh, for them to, to be subject to specific laws. All right, now that we've talked some about the, the requirements themselves and, and where things are headed, I want to talk about um, breach notification as, as good business. Um, there's, there's breach notification and then there's actual breach notification. Um, uh, Forbes recently published an article about the concept of breach notification as, as brand management. Um, you know, the idea that, that a breach, a data breach isn't necessarily going to break a brand. Um, but the breach response might do even more harm or total harm to an organization that handles the breach poorly. Um, and then there's, there's the tension between a risk of transparency and a risk of obfuscation. So for example, um, you know, uh, uh, public, from a public relations perspective and a customer service perspective, transparency uh, is, is more likely to generate a, a positive response. But legal compliance and security individuals within an organization might be reluctant to be uh, transparent because of the potential consequences to litigation and, and for security purposes. There's also a tension between um, speed and accuracy. Uh, there's, there's, you know, um, when organizations are first investigating and understanding a breach, there's inevitably going to be information that they don't fully understand. Um, and yet there's a difference between uh, rolling information out in phases or a or, uh, reasonable amount of time to investigate and understand something before communicating things that are incorrect and outright delay um, that, that is, uh, doesn't benefit accuracy. And then there's the, the tension between speed and accuracy in terms of rolling things out or communicating things just to get, some, just to get sort of get ahead of the negative media cycle um, and hope that people will ultimately forget about uh, the incident when more information becomes transparent and it becomes um, a, a apparent that um, an organization sort of fudged what they shared at the beginning just to get something out there. Um, so that the adage of it to be quick than, than right. So you've got a tension between these, these different um, principles and approaches. And I wanted to go through a couple of different um, examples um, of cases where you can see how different organizations handle these uh, concepts and principles in their breach uh, notification programs in terms of transparency and speed and accuracy. Um, so, so let's talk first about um, Uber and Home Depot. And these are, these are um, incidents that have occurred several years ago, but I think they serve as, as good examples of, of how different organizations choose to respond to breaches. So at the end of 2016, Uber received notice from a hacker of a breach of about 57 million individual records. Um, that, that number included both riders and drivers. And under the premise of a bug bounty program, Uber paid the hacker $100,000. And, uh, and the story in 2016 it never, it never came up. But um, there was an internal investigation at Uber and they discovered the situation and, um, and re totally revised their bug bounty program. And as a result, they had um, regulatory sanctions in 48 states and it cost Uber $148 million. And some think that the claim that 
the payment was part of a bug bounty program was, was disingenuous based on the nature of the access and the, the response. And Uber has, has changed its, its bug bounty program as a result. Um, so that, that's, that's one way to handle it is to, to try to hide it and pay it off um, and, and request the hacker not disclose uh, what, what happened. On the other hand, you have Home Depot. You're going back a little bit farther in terms of time, but in 2014, they had a data breach that involved both uh, email addresses and credit card information for approximately 50 million users. And, and the difference between uh, Home Depot and Uber is there is a tremendous sense of transparency. Um, the CEO at the time uh, uh, made a statement of apology um, and Home Depot started notifying customers about the incident before it even had a full story about the breach. Um, and they posted statements and press releases and answers to frequently asked questions and uh, included a statement that said, you know, customers aren't going to be responsible for any fraudulent charges. Now, Home Depot had a, certainly had a financial cost um, uh, to its, its breach. So, so I'm not, the, the goal isn't here to say that, that Home Depot paid the last or was financially less. It settled for uh, up, you know, approximately $200 million um, with banks, but that's partly because it had credit card and so That is because their credit card information was involved in the breach. So there's some, some limits to making direct apples to apples comparisons between two or more breaches and drawing conclusions. But there is enough historical data from cases going back beyond Uber and Home Depot to to indicate that transparency is a better strategy from a regulatory perspective, not just from a brand management perspective, but from a regulatory perspective. In terms of speed and accuracy, um, we're going to compare Equifax and MyHeritage. Um, Equifax, uh, um, you know, experienced a breach of uh, over 100, almost approximately 150 million records, and the response um, from from Equifax was to tweet out a link uh, that pointed users to a, a potentially a domain that was potentially a scam. Um, uh, the contact info included um, for, for impacted individuals was a hotline that had some calls that went unanswered. And then for those who, who were seeking their credit report, uh, there were arbitration clauses, so waiving your right to sue. And so, um, Equifax, in terms of, of being um, quick, uh, was um, not quick at all. Uh, there were there are reports about potential breaches uh, from from banks and some others that that were potentially linked back to Equifax before Equifax ever admitted anything. On the other hand, you have MyHeritage, which is like a um, Ancestry.com type of website related to DNA and um, family trees. And uh, MyHeritage was the complete op opposite of, of Equifax in terms of speed. Not only did, did nobody um, identify there was a potential breach before they did, they had same day notice of, of the incident and then were updating the information the very next day um, about what was going on with the breach. And so um, again, the, the goal isn't to say that if you are quick and you're transparent, there isn't gonna be any financial uh, complications for settlements or regulatory actions. But the, the, the principle does seem to be borne out by these, these case studies that um, if you are uh, transparent, there's gonna be a, a, a better response from not only individuals, but from, uh, from regulators. And um, so, uh, so it's important to, um, Set up principles within your breach notification response and make sure that your, your organization is coherent on the sense of transparency and speed and accuracy um, that your organization is going to, to use when it comes to breach notification. Um, just to give one more example on in terms of accuracy and speed versus a short attention span, we have um, the British Airways response. Um, this is an example of putting something out there and hoping that people at least from my perspective, hoping that people don't care enough uh, if you have to change your story later um, in terms of, you know, how much data was actually exposed, what type of data, you know, actually being much more sensitive data, um, that there was actually a much longer period of exposure and unauthorized access. Those are all just things that, that could likely be true that 
some organizations have um, have not shared at the beginning, even if they were fast. So from from British Airways breach, uh, you know, the positive of it is they discover the breach on a Wednesday night and disclose the breach on a Thursday morning. That's pretty quick. But the bad uh, 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 part of their response is that they didn't initially state um, that credit card information was accessed. They they did confirm that later on, but initially. Uh, that would be some of the most pertinent information to consumers to know, especially when you're dealing with an airline where where um, you know payment is being uh, where where payment is likely to occur, and so credit card information is likely to be available. Um, they didn't initially share that. They didn't give specifics about which parts of the credit card information was accessed. I, you know, they didn't share whether the CDV was was accessed, and then they told everyone to cancel their credit cards. So there was a uh, a challenge in some of the, the card issuers and trying to handle all of the requests to cancel. So, uh, you know, as I said on the positive, they were quick, less than, you know, probably 12 hours between discovery and notification. But but their accuracy suffered potentially in part because of how quickly they they responded to um, to the breach. So so it's as I said, it's 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 you know speed is um, a, a necessary element of a breach notification, not only from a regulatory pr perspective, but also from a branch management perspective. But um, you don't want to be quick to uh, disclose a breach at the cost of accuracy that could result in, um, in inaccurate information and um, embarrassment or regulatory sanctions. And then this isn't a, a case example, but this is just a, an example where breach, ma breach notification continues to be good business and brand management from a regulatory perspective. In Japan, it's not it's te technically a requirement within data, data protection laws to report an incident to uh, supervisory authorities. However, the PPC guidelines recommend that breach notification made, and that's that's the standard practice in Japan is is to report uh, to report incidents. So um, there's a, a significant impact um, in Japan if um, breaches are unreported, even though the law doesn't require, require it. So that's a, a long way of, of hammering home the same point that, that transparency is, is actually a good thing in terms of the outcome from a regulatory perspective and also the outcome from a, a brand management perspective. And the truth is that most of the time, um, the details are going to be disclosed at some point, whether by the organization or against the organization's wishes through a regulatory body or, or third party investigators. So the likelihood that an organization can really just, uh, you know, keep information about a breach under wraps in, in this day and age is very unlikely. So it's sort of a matter of, do you want to control and manage the situation or do you want to be uh, constantly responding to uh, corrections and updates further disclosure about the sensitivity of information or the amount of information or the, the amount of time the breach went unaddressed or unreported. Um, and, and that's always a, a bad look. And, and regulators are human beings. Uh, having worked for, for state and federal governments before, um, when, when they smell something, when regulators smell something that doesn't look right, they're, they're more likely to push and investigate more. So it just it seems like the, the positives of transparency uh, and speed and accuracy outweigh any any potential gain from from withholding information all right now that we've covered some of the the case studies um, wanted to uh, talk through um, some principles about breach notification now is the time to establish your breach notification process um, doing it uh, working on your breach notification process while you're um, in the middle of a crisis is not ideal or effective so um, it's important to note that um, breach notification is simply a part of your incident, or simply is probably not the right word, but is essentially a part of your incident response um, policy. You should have a designated incident response team. Um, there should be restoration, investigation, mitigation, and corrective action for the incident. Breach notification slots into uh, those, those parts, uh, multiple parts of the incident response program there should be a designated individual or individuals responsible for identifying who needs to have disclosure and what needs to be disclosed and when it, when it needs to occur. Um, uh, the breach notification is gonna have to include the mitigation steps 
and um, some of the investigation steps. So, um, so breach notification should work in conjunction with your incident response. Um, as I said, you need to have roles, uh, designated roles. Those typically include um, legal counsel, um, security, and, and management, and either internal or external crisis management individuals. So uh, public relations or um, PR uh, type of, of roles, whether those are inside or outside. As I mentioned before, a philosophy of breach notification um, is as important as the specifics itself of, of when and who and how. Um, what kind of disclosure is your organization comfortable with? What's the approach it's going to take um, when when stress from an incident is is high? It's going to be much more difficult to get consensus on how much information to share and when to share it and who to share it with. So um, a good exercise, um, either a part of business continuity planning or incident response testing, is to talk through, uh, you know, g give members of the incident response and breach notification team the chance to talk through what types of information they would disclose and when and how. Um, and, you know, press releases, statements, websites, um, all of those different things to flesh out your organization's approach because you want to be consistent. Not only do you, are there good principles, but it's also important to be consistent. Um, the elements of risk analysis and safe harbor. Knowing that not all security incidents require breach means that your organization should have a familiarity with the different requirements and the different standards for what rises to the level of a reporting requirement. Um, content, as I mentioned before, you could uh, take the, the elements of the most broad breach notification requirement and probably satisfy um, all or most of the breach notification laws that your organization may be subject to. And then distribution, making sure that you're clear, your organization is clear on who specifically needs um, notification not only the government entity, but, but what individual or what department at a, at a government supervisory authority needs um, notice. And is, do they have a form or is there some other um, special instruction on how to communicate with them? And then if it's individuals, how would your organization actually notify individuals through, through email or, um, or mass uh, publication or, or uh, traditional mail? What would be the way that you'd actually do that? Do you need a vendor? Do you need a process? so that when the breach occurs, you can be timely um, as well as accurate. So that's what recommendations take away from, from today is, is to note um, some areas of review for your incident response and breach notification policies. One sort of side note on um, breach notification that, that I expect become, will become more and more of an issue as more and more organizations uh, take advantage of or choose cyber liability insurance is that um, it is common for cyber liability insurers to um, exhibit control or exert control over the breach notification response process. And I've, I've got uh, a just one example. I don't have any, I'm not intending to criticize or promote this particular insurer, but I just wanted to demonstrate to you an example of um, breach notification as, as part of the, li the, the insurance coverage itself. And so you should know uh, or have discussions with your insurer to determine how they, their philosophy, are, are they, do they lean towards the side of transparency or, or to the side of, of being more opaque? Do they, do they lean towards the side of quick uh, and maybe less accurate or um, to the side of being deliberate and, and delaying things even at the cost of image and um, potentially running afoul of, of supervisory authorities? Um, their expertise, how you would work with them, what information you'd have to share, uh, just the process of bringing in a third party to navigate all the challenges of, of breach notification would be difficult. So this is just a point of, of awareness for your organization. If you do have um, cyber liability insurance, you should know what it covers in terms of breach notification and how that would actually work and if you're comfortable with that. All right, so um, now that we've got that note out of the way, we're kind of towards the end of our presentation today. Um, just in kind of some breach notification is, um, for in, in general terms, unavoidable. From just a percentages perspective, half of the organizations on this call will experience a breach if they haven't already. They will experience a breach in 2019. Um, and the consequences in terms of 
um, image and financial and regulatory impact are significant. So taking that sort of, uh, I know we haven't seen any cake approach uh, as, as indicated by the Uber case, it isn't, isn't the most effective. Second, um, breach notification implementation can be simplified. Um, if you're uh, proactive in identifying the regulatory sources that generate your breach notification requirements or contractual sources, if you've got um, client notification uh, elements uh, in your breach notification response, you can take those common elements of, of information and process and come up with a relatively coherent approach that can reduce an already challenging situation. And then to approach brand breach notification from a brand management perspective, not merely uh, something to be endured, but a way of furthering your company's mission. Um, I think if it, if it is true that breach notification is unavoidable, then organizations should, should uh, endeavor to do breach notification well with excellence. And even though that may seem counterintuitive in terms of doing something that's inherently bad and negative, um, you know, with excellence, uh, there, there is really, there's only two choices. It's to do it well or to do it uh, poorly. Um, and so, um, as I said, it's not likely that a breach is going to end an organization, but the response to a breach could certainly have much more significant negative impacts than the actual breach itself. So hopefully the, the um, specifics on the regulatory requirements, um, the case studies, and the principles that helps you uh, give you something as you go back and look at your, your incident response and your breach notification program um, and to, to challenge it and evaluate it and see uh, if there are any areas that you can improve on. Well, with that, we do have uh, plenty of time for questions today. Um, just as a point of information, um, let us know if we can help. Uh, Kirkpatrick Price is an information security firm with data privacy services. Um, uh, with the kind of people and expertise to simultaneously address those security and privacy needs. And uh, we have the ability to provide services that relate to global and custom privacy and uh, data security requirements. So um, all of these things that we talked about today are not just uh, interesting pieces of information for, for us, but they're things that we want to become experts on or are experts on so that we can serve our clients. So if there's any way we can help you with your breach notification process, uh, or other information security or data privacy needs, let us let us know. All right, Jen, I think that sets us up for questions. Great. Um, and I'll say also as a reminder that um, you will get a copy of this presentation in the slides. So you can pass it on to um, a colleague or anyone else who's kind of involved with brief no breach notification. Um, our first question is about working with a PR firm. Um, just, do you have any advice on how to find a good PR firm for breach notification purposes? Uh, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't, don't have a specific firm or, or list of firms that I would recommend just because that's not the purpose of this, but that's a, a good question. The things I would focus on is their experience in dealing with information security issues. Uh, because that's a different crisis response than um, sort of a, you know, a negative story about a business leader um, or a scandal that involves the organization or some kind of disaster or product recall. Um, so look for a third party that has experience um, in, in working with information security issues. That, that could include both the fact that they could refer you to other clients and individuals within their organization that understand the concepts of um, cybersecurity, hacks, breaches, and, and notifications, so that they're actually speaking the language from their own experience rather than having to be fed from, from uh, you know, getting everything from you. You're, you're going to them for their expertise, not, not wanting to, to provide that expertise to them. And then also um, look for a, a, a firm that has a similar philosophy to your organization. Um, you know, there are varying degrees of transparency and disclosure and approach um, that reasonable organizations could look at and, and use for, for a breach response. Um, so does the PR firm err on the side of, you know, being really, uh, can, can they be transparent in a way that's professional um, and understanding, or, or does their philosophy conflict with how much you want to share and how you want to share it? So those would be the two, two pieces of advice I would give for working with a PR firm. Great. Um, our next question is, 
how and where do you find uh, breach notification laws and information for each state? Is there some sort of central, you know, table or matrix that's online that we can find, or is it a guessing game? <laughs> Good question. So um, our organization does have some content about um, breach notification laws, but we aren't. Uh, uh, that's not our, our our core function. So there are two two sources. One is there are a couple of different law firms out there that have published good uh, matrices of breach notification laws. And then the other source is one that I've used professionally um, in, in working in the list in legislative bodies and also working in other capacities. And that's NCSL, that stands for the National Conference of State Legislatures. They have a, a really good website, ncsl.org. Um, this isn't, we have no financial relationship with them. They're not a, um, connected to us in any way, but they, um, they're really good about publishing developments in terms of, of breach notification and they you can do research with them and they've actually got people that will occasionally if you can access them talk talk to you about issues so they'll publish things and then also people that you can uh, reach out to and they typically break things down by subject matter so information security would be a an area that's that's a data privacy or areas that are that are um, in the spotlight so they most likely will have um, information around what you're looking for Gotcha. Um, another question is, you know, because there are so many different departments and people involved with incident response, Mark, you, you alone mentioned, you know, legal, IT, outside help. Um, is there one person or one department that's the most kind of major that would take charge of making sure that your organization is following breach notification uh, laws properly? I can tell you what I typically see, and that's either a compliance or legal uh, personnel handling the, the actual notification. Um, but typically what we see is uh, security personnel, information security or information technology personnel responsible for the incident itself. Um, and so it, it's typically a sort of a sub, you know, a secondary layer of leadership or expertise where compliance or, or legal is responsible for working with uh, technology and security personnel to identify what happened and then provide the external communication because you, you'd ideally have someone who's familiar with the requirements. Um, it's one thing to sort of access, you know, all this breach notification information is publicly available, but it's one thing to sort of be able to access it and a different thing to know it, know it really well and, and maybe even have relationships with regulators in an industry. You know, if you're in the healthcare field and you, you have connections at DHHS to navigate the breach response. Um, so that's the typical way I see it is the incident response team is led by a technology or security personnel, but the breach portion is, is led by someone with a compliance or a legal background. Gotcha. We have um, kind of a specific uh, example here. Um, an ENT practice just suffered a ransomware attack. They didn't pay the ransom, but ended up closing and lost all of their patient data. They claim it was not a reportable breach because an IT professional said that no PHI was exfiltrated. Um, and this person is asking, is it not a breach under the 2016 HHS guidance patient safety issue um, because PHI is now unavailable for treatment? So I, I am. Uh familiar with that that story um i i'm without knowing all the specific specifics of that story i will tell you it doesn't pass the smell test to me but that's not going to be a reportable incident and, and i think uh without speaking poorly of, of regulators uh, as i said i was one at a time um that that it's going to be hard to make an argument that that's not a reportable incident even if uh from, from just a PR perspective. Um, not only are, are regulators humans in terms of something seems suspicious, they're going to pursue it more, more in depth. They're also aware of public, the public response themselves on, on their organization, how they respond. So um, I, I wonder, um, I wonder what individual is giving them that advice and, and the practical and public perception realities of that, whether there were anything whether they considered things rather than just the technical requirements, which they may not even be correct on, but they just considered the, the public response. And the brand management doesn't seem to be considered in that case. 
Gotcha. Um, we have another person asking uh, when a health plan is based in California, does HIPAA notification trump CCPA? Are they exempt from CCPA? Yeah, that, that's generally going to be the case when uh, federal law is generally, you know, uh, typically preempts state law. So um, without offering legal advice and knowing the specifics, uh, that's that's an important part of identifying the regulatory frameworks that you have in you know that you're subject to, so that you can make sure that if there are conflicting reporting requirements, you know which one trumps. But but uh, HIPAA is most likely going to be the uh, I think uh, CCPA actually exempts uh, PHI from the obligations of the of CCPA, not just the breach notification requirements. Uh, we have several people asking to repeat um, where to find information about breach notifications in the U.S. and different laws. And you said ncsl.org. Yep. National Conference of State Legislatures is what that acronym stands for. And again, it's a good resource because uh, they also have information on state laws that relate to information security and data privacy. Um, and so there's there's going to be cases until, you know, I say until because I, I think the likelihood of a federal, a U.S. federal data privacy sort of overall information security breach certification law is going to come in the near future. But until we're at that place, there's a, a myriad of state laws. So California, it's not just Cal CCPA and HIPAA, it's the CCPA and HIPAA and the California breach certification law, which has already existed for some time. So um, ncsl.org is a great, a great resource. And we'll um, we'll try to link to that also in our follow-up email with you guys, so you can kind of find that easily. Um, um, another question about kind of small companies or small breaches, maybe versus larger ones. Um, the question says the examples in this presentation were for large companies. Is breach reporting different for small companies or a breach that is you know less amount of individuals? It's a good question. So the larger breaches tend to draw the most um, attention because we we tend to get most uh, of a beginning to end perspective on what happened and how they handle it. Smaller firms typically aren't going to be organizations aren't going to be able to hire a PR firm or, or choose not to hire a PR firm, and it just may not generate the kind of attention. So it's a good question. There aren't the the laws that I, the four laws that we referenced from Canada GPR from the EU uh, and the two US laws, don't break breaches down based on, in terms of whether it's a breach based on the size, it's, it's typically a risk uh, approach. If, if you had unencrypted data for one patient under HIPAA um, that meets the risk analysis criteria, then you've got a breach. Um, if you've got um, you know, unencrypted financial information for one EU data subject um, that, that meets the risk threshold, then, then you have a breach. Um, the reporting elements and requirements might be a little bit different. So for example, under HIPAA, there are different reporting requirements if the breach exceeds 500 patients. Um, but the nature of the breach and the, and the basic requirements don't change, whether it's one individual or more, and whether the organization is uh, you know, a three-person healthcare practice or um, you know, a 3,000-person hospital. Great. Um, thank you for that, Mark. I think that was a, that was a great question. Um, and our last one to wrap it up for today, um, again, about cyber liability insurance. We don't talk a ton about that here at Kirkpatrick Price. Um, so, Mark, if you kind of just want to re-summarize what cyber insurance is and and all that. Sure. So, uh, it, it, cyber liability insurance is a product to uh, uh, address risk, the financial consequences of an information security threat. Um, so, it, it's it's the same concept as you know uh, professional insurance, only it's it's specifically for cybersecurity and privacy issues. Um, 
when there is a, a loss related to technology services or products. So, um, you know, what kind of liability a business has, organization experiences a breach, and the cyber liability insurance covers an organization to some extent, uh, or the theory is for, for a breach for personal information. Um, and there's, uh, you get the, the policies can be different. So they can include things like breach notification costs, the actual costs of notifying individuals, credit monitoring, um, legal costs to defend claims by regulators, fines, penalties, and losses that result from identity theft. Um, so, uh, so th those are some of the, the areas that uh, a cyber liability uh, policy might cover is, is sort of, you know, the financial impacts of it, the regulatory impacts of it, um, and the, the actual notification portion of it. And again, and, and my, my statement wasn't intended to discourage or encourage cyber liability insurance. Uh, um, you know, it's a common practice and I expect to see it become even more common. It's just a point of awareness. Um, it, it creates a, a different set of dynamics, relational and regulatory for when it comes to breach notification that I think a lot of organizations hadn't thought through. Um, because they just hope, again, it goes back to the, we don't see any cake. They hope that they're never going to have a breach. And they, they may have thought, genuinely thought they didn't have any breaches. So why, why the need to go through an exercise of talking with their cyber liability insurer to talk through their philosophy on breach notification? Um, there's much more interesting things for most organizations to do uh, and that are revenue generating. So, um, those, those are the things that I would, would, um, so that's, that's the nature of cyber liability insurance. It's related to technology breaches, and it covers a variety of things, including notification, credit monitoring, cost to defend, fines, penalties, and identity theft impacts. So um, that's what you could potentially get in a, in a policy. Um, think through that. Sometimes it's required to enter into certain contracts, so you're kind of out of luck if, if that's the business you want to do. Um, just know how to handle those dynamics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, if you, if I somehow missed your question, um, we'll get you connected with Mark. And if you have any other questions, um, his email is on the screen. And you've got my email in your inbox. So feel free to reach out to us. And once again, you'll get this presentation tomorrow um, or maybe even sometime today. And thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Mark.